Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Engelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and from the corporate community, Mutual of America. I'm Alexander Hefner, your host on The Open Mind. Our guest today was senior advisor to former British Prime Minister David Cameron, co-founder and CEO of Crowdpack, a political data technology startup. Our guest is Steve Hilton, a self-described radical for democracy, whose Crowdpack, in layman's terms, is helping political outsiders raise money and run for office, tracking data from across the United States. Hilton recently launched the one-hour television Fox program, The Next Revolution, to examine the impact of the populist movement in the United States and abroad. We're going to be looking at the failures of the elitist policies that we've seen now for decades, considering a positive agenda for changes that will actually help people in their daily lives. I'm calling it positive populism. Those are Steve's words, and it's a pleasure to welcome him today. Thank you for being here. Great to be here. It's very nice hearing those words. I thought, I really agree with that. <laughs> it turns out it was me all along. So yes, that's our plan on the show. And it actually is, um, it's, it's great to be able to uh, be on the other side of the conversation and be with you today. Excellent. Fox News, mm -hmm. Sunday evenings. Sunday, 9 Eastern, yeah. Live 9 memory. Eastern. Sunday night. You have a fascinating career in the political sphere, and now are exposed to American electoral currents, mm -hmm. or electric currents, I should say. Um, the state of populism since Donald Trump's election and since Brexit, what has changed since those pivotal mm -hmm. decisions? Well, I think that the the first thing we need to do is take a, a, a large number of steps backwards because the forces that led to those um, big moments in, in, in political history, both in the, in the UK and here in America, the forces that, that, that prompted these revolutions really against the, the ruling elite and the way policy had been conducted for many decades have been going on for decades. They've been building and building. It's not a, it's not a sudden thing. Um, and I think that the heart of it is this um, is, is the way in which um, power in the economy, in government um, and, and across the board has just been centralized. Too much power, too much control has ended up in too few people's hands. And you see that in all sorts of ways. You see that in income inequality, the way that um, uh, really going back now a couple of um, decades, there's been a complete detachment from what we used to see in the economy, which is economic growth going up, wages and incomes going up, shareholder returns going up, all pretty much aligned. But a couple of decades ago, that just completely split. And the returns and the income gained by the owners of companies completely shot up the chart, whereas uh, wages basically uh, were flat or stagnant. So that's just one example where the people, the concentration of economic power is a contributor to that. But you see it when you, in, 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 in our government and politics as well, and that's actually um, the other side of the story, really, uh, of, of my story, which is Crowdpack, where when you think about um, democracy and the way it operates in America today, so much of the power has ended up in the hands of so few people. And at the heart of that is money, because the, the biggest factor influencing who gets elected who's in Congress and in state legislatures making the laws that people live by, is money, is how you can, whether you can raise money. And the money is coming, again, from a, from a more and more concentrated 
group of people and organizations. The, and that's why I think the, the money problem in politics is at the heart of everything else. And that's why we started Crowdpack, to try and end that stranglehold of the big money donors on the political system and make it easy, for, as you mentioned, for anyone to run for office at any level, federal, state or local, without relying on the traditional systems of party finance and, and, and all those things that actually have ended up concentrating power in, in, so, in, in just the hands of a few people. So your organization is in contact with or can be a host in effect for candidates who may want to emerge on the scene for 2018 yeah. but lack the resources or the platform Yes, that's the, that's the crucial the word. Funds. The platform is exactly the right word. We're, we're an open platform. We're nonpartisan, so we, anyone can use Crowdpack. A way to think about it really is, is um, which people will be very familiar with, is it's like a sort of crowdfunding platform, and people will be familiar that, with that in other areas. For example, uh, Kickstarter for, for, for sort of more arts-based projects and GoFundMe for, uh, for raising money for charities. We're really that kind of service for politics. So anyone watching can literally right now go to crowdpack.com and create a page that, that can help them raise money. And at start, you don't even have to be an actual donation. You can start by raising pledges if you're thinking about running for some office. Because remember, a lot of people, it's, it's quite a big deal to take that plunge, to decide. A lot of people discuss whether they might run for office. Oh, I can do a better job than than those idiots we have right now, or they may know someone. Yeah, oh, they, you know, you have this conversation the whole time. You know you what, you should run for office, you'd be really good. But actually going from that thought to actually doing it is, is, is really tough, and there are lots of barriers in the way, and one of them is this idea of raising money. People think, oh, you need all this money, I don't want to ask my friends for money, it's all a hassle, I don't know what, even where to start. You can go to Crowdpack, create a page, either raise money directly so people can make a donate. If you're already in a race and you're already running, could be for town council or it could be for governor of your state, well, state legislature, it doesn't matter. There are half a million elected offices, roughly, in America. So there's so many ways in which you can participate. And whether you want to be on the school board or Literally in the U.S. That's Senate, exactly right. you can pursue it. Let and me then, ask, but you don't, yes. have to, you don't have to have actually even decided to do it. You can start, we have a, a product on us, it's called Start Running. What it means is that you can create a page, you can write some, something about why, you, why you're thinking about running. Let's just take school board. You can say, I'm thinking about running for school board. We need change in our district. This is, the, this is the kind of change I'd like to see. Create a page in minutes, and then you can share that with your network, with your friends and family and so on. And they can pledge to your campaign. And the, but the pledge only turns into an actual donation Once you if you actually run. So this takes out all that hassle of setting up the infrastructure of a campaign and the legal work and hiring a finance person. And a you don't have to do any of that. You can literally just do it, start running. And then look, if you decide you don't raise much money or you don't have, have many pledges or you just don't think it's for you, you've not lost anything and no one has lost anything because it's just a pledge that only converts into a donation if you actually decide. So literally, when you, as you're going through the process on Crowdpack um, as a potential donor, we tell you very clearly, your card will only be charged if whoever it is actually runs. Through this platform, you're combating some of the pervasive and quite injurious inequity, the, the, the nature of the platform itself. We talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Are you ensuring that the candidates who you're working with are running to similarly combat inequity, or is that not a criteria you're using? No, we don't, we, we don't have any kind of judgment uh, about the candidates of, of any kind other than you know, obviously we're not going to allow, we have some community guidelines, which are the things you'd expect. Um, we, don't, we won't allow candidates um, on our site who, who uh, are not compliant with our community guidelines, which are all about decency and, and, and hate and, 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 and the things you'd expect. But um, other than that, we, we, we're completely open, we're non-partisan. The thing I would say to your point is that if a candidate raises their money on Crowdpack, and raises their money from the crowd, as, as our name suggests, and they're not reliant on that narrow group of big donors. What that means is that if they then succeed and if they're elected, they will be able to act independently and act in the interests of their constituents rather than their donors. 
Because what typically happens is that people get elected and then once they're there in office, you know, they make all their promises, once they're there in office, whose calls do they actually take? They're, they're big donors. The donors are the people who actually control the outcome of the policy making process once people are elected. And if, 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 if we boost the number of small donors to political campaigns, then you can make the politicians less reliant on these sources of In the of first income. demonstrable... That, that can, they, they can be more independent, not, not necessarily right. literally independent, as in an, the independent party, but independent-minded. So they can act in, in, in their judgment of what's, the, what's in the interest of their constituents, rather than just doing what their donors tell them. I hear you, Steve. The first case study, if you will, of whether or not that model is effective and they are serving their constituency mm -hmm. and not elite donors will be 2017, 2018. 20, it has yeah, already we, occurred. We've got thousands of candidates already raising money, running for offices. You know, it's roughly a third, a third, a third federal, state, and local. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we're we're a new startup, so we're just getting going, and our, and we've got big ambitions for the 2018 cycle, particularly. We, th we think it's interesting to, to look at those races where, because uh, uh, people haven't had a choice of candidate because you've got this massive other problem with our political system of gerrymandering where you have uh, many districts that are, that are just basically owned by one party. So often you don't even get a choice. Another, a candidate from another party doesn't even run. And so, for example, at the state level, in, in state legislatures, nearly half of all the seats are uncontested. So you've got people being elected to state legislatures, which have a huge impact on people's lives in terms of the, the, the you know, health care and, and local services and, and a lot of the stuff that actually affects our viewers who are watching is decided at the state level by state legislatures. And half those people, and, you know, they're literally elected because they, there's, a, there's a process, but there's no choice. There's no other candidate. So we're particularly interested in focusing on those areas where those districts where there hasn't been a candidate and the, and the parties have basically just uh, not got involved and making it easier for, for candidates to run for office to challenge those incumbents who haven't faced an opponent for many, many years. That's certainly enhancing the perspective quality of our democracy if you do target those yeah. districts where there have been absentee congressmen or town board well, it's just, there's no accountability. council members. If you don't have an opponent, and, and actually there's a large number, even in Congress, in the U.S. Congress, unbelievably, who have had no opponent either in the primary or the general election. How do you see democracy as a vehicle for accountability in these two systems with which you have great familiarity, in particular in the UK? Mm -hmm. We talked a bit off camera about the, the media's absorption of this narrative, populist mm -hmm. revolt mm -hmm. and now democracy under duress, through the Panama Papers and WikiLeaks yeah. as the, the bloodstream, in effect, of media coverage during the 2015 and 2016 experience mm -hmm. from Brexit through Sanders and Trump. Mm -hmm. Now that we're not in an election cycle um, in either country, mm -hmm. we're anticipating a possible future election of, of May and Corbyn again. We're mm -hmm. anticipating the midterms here. Uh, besides CrowdPack, where do you think that that populist energy mm -hmm. is well, going? I think, I think that, um, that let, let's just just take the U.S. Uh, to, to start with. I think that the, the argument I've been making, and not not just um, on the next revolution on, on Fox News, but also in, in in what I've written. I wrote a book um, that was published in the U.S. last year called More Human, um, and that's all. A, that's that's actually very connected to this as well. This this notion that everything. You know, our, again, economy, the way we run healthcare, schools, our food, the way we get our food, it's all become too big and bureaucratic and centralized and the power's been concentrated. And I think that what you saw as we, we started off discussing in the populist uprising is, is a, a kind of howl of rage against that. But what I've been trying to do is set out a, a positive agenda for turning that anger into real change with actual policy uh, proposals and a reform plan uh, that will actually take that anger and turn it into something positive and constructive. And I think you're, we're just at the beginning of that. This is a really, really big change. As I say, I, the, the world's been run a particular, and I, and I think it is a global phenomenon, see it in every country. It's been run pr pretty much along the same kind of lines, the same kind of ideology behind it, regardless of who's been in power, for many decades. And 
we're just at the beginning of the change. So this is going to take probably more decades before it plays itself out. When Facebook had its big IPO bonanza, mm -hmm. I proposed in a column that I wrote in the Christian Science Monitor that it ought to gift mm -hmm. one share to each user. Right. Well, maybe there aren't a billion shares, but it was emblematic mm -hmm. of the problem, which is the Green Bay Packers of American football mm -hmm. fame, that cooperative model of, of doing business, it doesn't have to be a union per se, mm -hmm. but having shared stakeholders. I think that's a, a huge idea. It's actually something that we put a lot of effort, I put a lot of effort into advancing in the UK, actually, when, when I was working in the, in the government in Downing Street. Cooperative, cooperatives, as, as, as we call them in the UK, I don't know if that term is in use here, but that kind of mutual ownership of businesses and enterprises that, for example, we really tried to advance that in healthcare, where we, where we looked at uh, parts of the UK National Health Service, whether that would be a doctor's surgery or a clinic and, and, or a hospital, and looked at whether we could actually mutualize it, turn it into an enterprise that was owned by the workers who actually delivered those services and gave, give them control over, over how it was run. So I, I, I love that idea. I think it's a perfect example of what I would call the, the, the more human agenda. That sounds like something that Sanders and Corbyn at least That's, would This is what I think is so interested interesting, in. and this is one of the things I'm really looking to explore on the show, but, and, and actually has been a real theme in the way I've approached a lot of this stuff, is that there are all these assumptions about what's left and what's right, and what is Republican and what's Democrat and, and in the UK, Labour and Conservative, and I think most of them are completely wrong, and most people don't think like that. Most people have a more interesting mix of positions on different issues. And I think that the real divide now is not actually left-right. It's, it's, it's the elite versus the people. It's, it's elitism versus populism. And where do you want power to lie? Do you want power to be in the hands of a few people? Now, the elites themselves wouldn't say, wouldn't say that. Of course, that sounds terrible. But their actions belie that. They do favor, for example, a regulatory approach on the economy that is relaxed about the lack of competition in different different industries, where the antitrust pr provisions in the economy have been completely weakened. The elites want that because they want the power. So the left-right thing, I think, what what uh, is, is 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 kind of becoming redundant as a way of looking at I agree, politics. But and so in the just yes, to finish the point in, on on the show, one of the things that I'm looking to explore is that interesting overlap between the populism of the left, you could say, in the form of Bernie Sanders, and the populism on the other side. And look at those areas where there might be alignment. And in terms of the guests that we have on the show, that you're often, very often, they're talking and they say, you know what, we actually agree, and that's what I'm interested in exploring. And in particular, um, focusing on, on in, 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 in the economic argument on what I describe as a pro-worker agenda. What can we do to improve the experience and the lives and the incomes and the living standards of working people? And that is something that really unites um, people who, it, on, in the political arena who might previously you would have thought of as, as opponents. You mentioned, though, the notion of collective, cooperative, mm -hmm. communitarian, Ka your kami, your kami, I, to some... But why is that? I, I, th I, I, I completely I, reject that. But I think it that is, that is I, I, I could make a case to you that that is a fundamentally conservative um, attitude. I mean, I could put my conservative uh, hat could. on and say, well, that is what conservatism is all about. I, I Going back to, you, to Edmund Burke I, I concur, in the UK, I the little platoons of society, that society is built on the foundations of individuals and families and communities working together, not the big centralized state. And the left-right divide is conservative. I'm, you could make this argument that, that actually it's conservatives who believe in those localized small institutions. Right. And it's the left who believe in a big centralized government. Your show... On I think that's, an extra, that's a caricature, but it is I'm a just caricature. making the argument to you that, that actually uh, what may... It, it's actually a failure, perhaps, of politicians on the right who have allowed their ideology to be, be perceived as something that rejects that kind of localism, where in, whereas in fact that is what it's built on. From your experience in the American political landscape so far, what have you found to be 
receptiveness to your argument that you can represent the Republican agenda with the kind of philosophy you espouse. Well, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not a Republican, and I, I don't but, see myself as particularly advancing any right. political organization. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for myself and the things that I believe in when, when I'm writing or when I'm, when I'm uh, on, uh, on the media or whatever. And, so, so I, and I'm really uninterested in which party picks up those ideas and, 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 and is interested in them and run with them. You know, I have meetings with people on the left, on the right. I, I'm, I'm really not partisan in that way. But the beauty of your program is that you do, it's one of the few shows on cable that attempts that reconciliation in a way that would allow people to have a more diverse understanding of the political spectrum and even a more diverse identity of their own politics. Well, that's, that's absolutely what I'm trying to do. So I, pre I appreciate that if you think that we're getting somewhere with that. And that, that's why I actually thought quite hard about that label and actually, you know, giving the, the, the theme of the show a name, positive populism, because I did want to create some kind of identity that people could uh, say, yeah, I, I, I'm part of that. I, 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 I sign up to this idea. Going back to the UK experience, you know, I've long said, I don't know if I've said it on this show, that the US should have a prime minister's questions. Mm -hmm. um, it is a way to invigorate a spirit and fidelity to civic life. And if you were lucky enough as a young boy, as I was on C-SPAN 3 at 2 o'clock in the morning, to watch Prime Minister's yeah. questions, then you would think the same thing. The, now maybe, I think, from, you know, I, I think it's there's a, a vanity, yes, but there's also this authenticity of, um, you know, politics can be spirited and, yeah. and at the same time I guess fun. it does. I mean, look, I've, I've been right involved in that process right <laughs> at the heart of it. And, right hand man. And it is, although funnily enough, I, I stopped I, I literally stopped participating in the in the preparation for Prime Minister's questions because I just thought the whole thing was such a joke because it is completely staged, and um, it is certainly it, and 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 literally the the I, I'm going to say something positive about it in a second because I do agree with you. That it's a positive <laughs> thing, but perhaps not what the, and and so, you know, literally the questions and answers are written in advance. They give they literally the questions are written down and handed to the members of parliament on the on the on the conservative side if it's a conservative prime minister same happens when tony blair was prime minister they write down the questions and they give it to and they so they're not all of them but some of them they're, they're called planted questions so that's that's something that goes on you're right that the 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 kind of key battle within that kind of i think it's half an hour now which is the five or six questions where the leader of the opposition and the prime minister go head to head that is very theatrical Obviously, those questions aren't planted because they're coming from the other side, but they're anticipated and prepared for, and there's a, there's a lot of craft that goes into it. I'll tell you the good thing about Prime Minister's questions, um, and, and uh, I think all Prime Ministers, even if they haven't said this publicly, uh, really, I know that, that, this, that, uh, that this is what they, not just David Cameron, who I worked for, but others. It's an incredibly good way for the Prime Minister as Chief Executive, if you like, of the government, to find out what's going on in the government. They, they spend a huge amount of time preparing for this, this uh, uh, half an hour confrontation. And they sit with the advisors and, and, say, and, they, and they anticipate all the questions. They say, well, if they ask me about immigration, what's going on? What's going on with our policy? Why hasn't it? It's, it's a really good mechanism, if you like, for a kind of internal audit of what's going on. And, and, and all the departments of, of, of the government sort of scurry around. They're all, they're literally, th that morning when they're preparing, they think, oh my God, we've got to be at our desk in case that we get a call from 10 Downing Street and say, what's happening to this policy or that policy? It's actually a really effective tool, really effective management tool. Well, you're talking to a nation that elected the apprentice president. So I think that prime minister's questions it brings the theatricality to public policy, mm -hmm. as you suggest, in a way that is so refreshing. Mm -hmm. And well, as a, a young, again, not to be too down on it. No, but I, it I does is, stage is is that it, it gives you part, a very strong sense of the character of the uh, the two leaders who are there, and that's an important part of politics, and that's an important part of 
of government, actually, is that the character of a leader matters. And that is revealed in that exchange. That's true. That's re revealed, and I think it shows the true colors of the, the would-be candidates, the parliamentarians. And frankly, if Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer had that opportunity mm -hmm. with Donald Trump or vice versa, I mean, it would have brought folks to the table with Barack Obama. Barack Obama would have loved that. I mean, he would have indulged in that in a way that I think would have earned him respect mm -hmm. among Republicans. And when you think of the next revolution, mm -hmm of our politics, you want it to be something that is unifying in looking at goal-oriented, mm -hmm. pro-social outcomes. Yeah, I agree with that. That's why I like to think of, the, and I, I've used this term, you know, the, the, the positive populism and, the, and this way of thinking about politics is very pragmatic. I think one of the problems is that we, we've had too much ideology and that traps politicians into thinking about problems in a certain way. And then the don and the reliance on the it goes back to money, and then the reliance on the donors, who themselves are often very ideologically driven, ca captures the politicians, and they're trapped in these in these positions that many of them understand aren't necessarily right, and they would like to compromise, and they would like to reach out. And then it goes back to the other conversation we had about the gerrymandering, because they're, what they're really worried about is not a challenge from the other party, but a challenge from within their own party, from the extreme end of it. So the, all these problems actually interconnect. Well, Steve, I think we're going to have to trade places because mm -hmm. I'd love to morph over there and watching your election night coverage most recently on the BBC live stream on YouTube. It is most civilized, and of course you are funny. I mean, Americans, we, we have our Larry Davids and Jerry Seinfelds of, of the contemporary age, but um, I think that your politicians your constituencies mm -hmm. prepare for and expect a, a decency and part of that decency in the UK as exemplified in those prime minister's questions is good cheer. Okay, I'm not sure I would, you're probably seeing the best of it, let's put it like that. Uh, that's true, at, at some point in the future we'll exchange those citizenships right. or we'll, we'll have dual citizenship and we'll We'll explore those questions. We've run out of time, Steve, but I hope we'll continue this exchange because sure. it's been most fruitful, and I appreciate your time, your wit, your charm, your candor on the air. Great to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to you in the audience. I hope you join us again next time for a thoughtful, witty excursion into the world of ideas. Until then, keep an open mind. Please visit the Open Mind website at 13.org slash openmind to view this program online or to access over 1,500 other interviews. And do check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Open Mind TV for updates on future programming. Continuing production of The Open Mind has been made possible by grants from Ann Olnick, Joan Gans Cooney, the Angelson Family Foundation, Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, Joanne and Kenneth Wellner Foundation, and to the corporate community, Mutual of America.